don't know that I've said this yet to all, and I kind of feel bad that I haven't, but um, I'm really grateful to have Kathy Risley uh, preach last week, and she has the gift of preaching and teaching, and we meet every week to kind of talk about pastoral things, and I feel like I haven't just said how grateful I am for you, so I just want to say I'm grateful for you, Kathy, and your leadership in this church. You guys can clap. Come on. There's a lot of people uh, in all kinds of leadership around here, but that's one I've just, I think I've forgotten to say thank you. So out, uh, in front of everyone else. And so I wanted to do that. Let's pray. God, again, it's a gift to worship. It's again uh, a gift to be in your presence. Technology or no technology, new space, different space, whatever it may be, God, we, we continue to worship because we're wired to worship and we're grateful that we have your word. Uh, so I pray, God, that your word would change us, that would do something in us, that I would stay out of the way and that you would work and your spirit would work in us as a community and as individuals. We just pray this in your name and all God's people said, amen. Okay, so um, raise your hand if you would say right now you are living the good life. (laughs) I saw a little bit of this. People looking around, why isn't my spouse raising their hand? Our life is good. It's good, honey. Okay, put your hands down. Now, I ask that, and some of y'all are thinking that's one of those pastor trick questions, and now I'm going to, you know, you're in my trap or whatever, but what does that really mean? You know, when we say like, oh, they, you know, they are living the good life. Well, depending on who you're talking to, I think it means different things. But what does it really mean when we talk about the good life and our, our seeking of the good life? Um, I remember an interview, I'm going to date myself a little bit, even though I'm not that old, um, but Barbara Walters, remember Barbara, was interviewing Ted Turner. And I've seen this on YouTube many times since then, but it's really interesting. So she's interviewing Ted Turner. If you don't know who Ted Turner is, I think he owned the Braves at one point. He owns all kinds of TV things. Um, He's the second largest landowner in our country right now. And you didn't know, he's the largest owner of bison in the world. Go figure. Um, Maybe you did know that. Uh, So so she's interviewing this guy with with crazy amounts of wealth. And she asks him this question, essentially, what is it like being so wealthy. And this is what Ted Turner said in that interview. This is not what Barbara uh, was thinking, by the way. He said, it's like a paper bag. Everyone sees the bag. Everyone wants it. And once you get the bag, you discover the bag is empty. Ted kind of pulled back the curtain on what I think a lot of us would call the good life. And thinking, what? I mean, how many people would uh, at first just say, I'll switch life with Ted any day? I mean, he's married to Jane Fonda. He had all these great things in his life. And he's saying that that life was an empty bag. I share that because the text uh, that I'm excited to preach from today is John 10. And John 10, Jesus says, this is what the good life is. He describes the full life, the abundant life, and the good life. Uh, but it's a little bit different, I think, than what people think Ted was experiencing. So I want to read John 10 one through 10, and you'll see it starts with kind of two metaphors, two parables, and at the end, it gets to this statement about the full life. So John 10, starting with verse one. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So they're kind of like, huh? And so he does parable number two. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. 
So when, when Jesus says the full life, or you could say the good life, the, the word means this. It means overflowing. Like think of something like this that's completely overflowing. That's what the full life means. And when Jesus is talking about it, he's talking about less about what we hold in our hands and more about what we have in our hearts. That's what he's talking about, the full life. And so to pause just a second before we go back and unpack all the sheep shepherd talk, just this last statement, Jesus came so that they, we, may have life and have it full, abundant, overflowing. And I want to pause there for a second because I think we've forgotten that. Jesus did not come so that we would be miserable, right? Jesus did not come just so we'd follow a whole bunch of rules and be perfect little moral creatures. Jesus came so that we may have life and have it abundant and full. And sometimes I think we forget that or need to remind other people. And I, I've said this to you all before, but sometimes even in worship, and if you're up front, if you're a worship leader or a preacher and we're singing, you look out, and we're singing some of these songs about how great our God is, but our faces, don't, they kind of don't match, right? It's like we've got to inform our face that God is great because it kinda, people kind of do this when they sing. And we need to inform ourselves sometimes of, oh, wait, the Christ has come that we have a full and abundant life. And so... Um, I want to recap this story, which if, you know, the Pharisees were a little bit confused by Jesus teaching on these two stories. And so here's a quick recap. He's saying that there are wall climbers. There are people who are thieves, he's calling them, or robbers that climb over the wall. So if you've ever seen, and I'll keep referring to the Middle East, because this is where the practice of being a shepherd, it probably looks today like it did back then or not much different. And so often you'll see like these big uh, brick pens uh, stone pins, and, and then there's a gate, and not a gate like this, but just an opening where the shepherd would often stand to protect the sheep, and so the sheep would be in the pen to be protected. And so it's saying that these thieves or robbers will jump over the side, but, but Jesus is the one who comes in through the gate and is the one who they listen to his voice. The sheep know the shepherd's voice, and the stranger, they run from the stranger. So he explains that, and then the Pharisees, they don't get it. They don't get what he's saying. So he says, okay, let me try again. And that's when he says, I'm the gate. So now he's saying, I'm the one that stands in that opening of the sheep pen. And he says, everyone who comes through me will be saved. But the, the thieves, the robbers, they're the ones that come to, to kill and, and destroy. And so that's kind of this second story he shares. And I think the Pharisees and some of the other disciples are starting to understand what he's getting at. And so I think to unpack some of these people, the, the first is the thief. So when he keeps talking about thieves and robbers, who's Jesus talking about? He's referring to people, actually uh, religious folks, potentially Pharisees, who have taken advantage of the sheep, of the people of God, who have kind of come in from a different way and for their own gain have misled or taken advantage of the sheep, of the people of God. And so one way to look at it, the thieves are the ones who take life. And so without going too far down this trail, there are people still in religion today, in the Christian faith, who I believe are taking advantage of their churches, taking advantage of their people. And I think that's who Jesus is speaking of, people before him who did this, and still people to this day who are taking advantage um, of, of the people of God. And then there's sheep. I should bring the Risleys up here. We actually have a family in our church that owns sheep, right? But Everyone who would have heard this parable would know a lot about sheep. So this, this parable for us, this metaphor might break down because many of us maybe have never even touched a sheep. But they knew exactly what Jesus was talking about when he used this metaphor. So what do you know about sheep? Anyone know anything about sheep? Lainey, what do you know about sheep? They scream to wake you up when they're hungry, right? They're always making noise. What else? What's the reputation about sheep? Skittish. Dumb. <laughs> All the Risleys are answering right now <laughs> as they live with sheep. <laughs> oh, we got another one. What do you know about sheep? Thank you. They, a positive one. They have wool and some have hair. Thank you. <laughs> now we're going to biology lesson on animals. But here's the thing about sheep. Sheep, they, they are tame. There aren't wild sheep. Have you thought about that? There aren't wild sheep. All, all sheep are tame. And uh, I would say they're probably the best seller on the predator snack list, right? Everybody would like to have, have some sheep. That 
what's true of sheep, we can say they're not that smart, but they actually need to be led out of pasture into new pasture, or they can actually starve to death. Like, they, they actually have to be told, hey, you can't keep eating that dirt. You've got to go over here where there's grass. Or, hey, there's no water in there. There's water over here. Come on, little buddy. And they have to be led to those places. Without a shepherd, they're in trouble. I mean, sheep, like a turtle, they can get on their back and die because they can't flip back over. And if it's too hot, then they can die. So helpless, needy. And so now some of you are thinking, now, wait a second. Every time that Jesus talks about sheep, is he talking about us? Now, some of you might feel offended. For me, I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right, you know? I flip up on my back sometimes, and I need Jesus to flip me back over. Uh, needy. But I started thinking about some of these other things about why the, this metaphor works as I think about us, as I think about humanity and, and about sheep. I think we struggle with direction. We need direction. I think we need protection. Whether we realize it or not, we need protection. We need direction. I think we're vulnerable. I think if we're honest and humble, that we're prone to wander. We're prone to just kind of take off over that way and wander from faith, wander from responsibility. I would say like sheep, some of us struggle with being afraid. And we need, we need help in those areas. And so I think, yeah, that makes sense. I would say, I get this. And when we realize our sheepiness, I think we realize our need for a shepherd, a savior. So as we talk about what does it look like to have the, f- the full or abundant life, I think for me it starts with recognizing my own sheepiness and that I really do need a shepherd. I need a guide. I can't do this all on my own. And for a lot of my life, that's what it's been. I got this. I got this. I got this. And there's this recognition that we need uh, a shepherd. Now this is, I think, the best insight I read this week about the shepherd. And it just makes sense. That um, the shepherd is everything to the sheep. Everything. So if you think in like the context in the Middle East, uh, a shepherd who is with the sheep, um, they depend on the shepherd for everything, for uh, the next pasture, for finding where the water is. He sleeps in the gate for protection. They need him for everything. And so I keep thinking, I'm a pastor of a church. I should say I need him for everything. But if I'm honest, do I really depend on him or need God for everything? Literally, a sheep needs a shepherd for everything. The shepherd doesn't go home. Like I, I've traveled and I've, I remember in Palestine and seen all these shepherds who, who sleep and they out there and they live with their sheep. They never go home. It's not like they work four tens and then get a long weekend. They never leave their sheep. Think about the image as you think about God. Like right now, I think there's probably not many sheep in the whole world right now that the shepherd doesn't know where they are. Every, sh- every sheep in the world right now probably has a shepherd who knows their whereabouts. Okay, so what does all this have to do with the full life? What does this whole stuff about a thief and sheep and sheep pen and gates and shepherd have to do with the full life? To me, it has much to do with hearing. Because that's if you read through this story, it's a lot about hearing the shepherd's voice. And so it said that um, he calls them by name. Think about that just for a second. The, the shepherds today have like this whistle or a yell, or something that their sheep know their voice. And they spend enough, enough time where they actually know the identity of their sheep. And so a lot of the flocks, if you look, they're, they're mixed flocks. And so there'll be several shepherds and a whole bunch of sheep together. But a shepherd can start calling for his flock, and that group will follow their shepherd, and the others will stay. And so he calls their name, and he goes out ahead of them. When he calls their name, it tells us something about the shepherd and their relationship. They know each other. But when he goes ahead of them, what does that tell us? It tells us the shepherd is a protector. He goes out and check th- checks things first before the sheep follow. And they follow. It says they, they hear their name and then they follow. These are the sheep. These are the people of God. But hearing requires time. And to me, I would say for me personally in our culture, this is one of the hardest things. I remember learning something about raising kids and it said, how do you spell time? Um, or how do you spell love? T-I-M-E, right? That if we're honest, the people that we love in our, in our lives, do we actually spend time with them? And how much time do we spend? And it really shows people that we love them. I would say that is what it means with the sheep and the shepherd or us with our creator, is it really, it takes time. And we're kind of in a shortcut culture. There's no shortcut in this, and we live in a shortcut culture. I love a good shortcut. 
You know, and you can see all these things like you could lose a ton of weight in just 30 minutes. Great. Let's try that. Give me that pill. Right. Um, and all these different things we can do. I, I know with all the traffic that happens like at Oleander in college, that little cutoff going towards the beach from college parkway by the park. Uh, you're, you feel like you're beating the system, you know, and who doesn't love a good shortcut? And all these people are piled up at the light. Or if you've been to Disney and you had a fast pass, I mean, it's like, yes, I beat the system. Everyone's waiting in line, and I just went and got on that ride. But when it comes to, to hearing God and what he has to say to us, there's no shortcut when it comes to just spending time and listening. Like, how do you become familiar with someone's voice? By spending time. I think about like, um, you know, when there'll be a whole bunch of kids playing and that one mom yells, son, and that one son of 40 boys, ah, and he hears his mom's voice and he goes. Or when someone's crying and back and forth and a mother and a child, they can hear and notice each other's voices. Another example I can think of is I went coon hunting with a bunch of guys and all these dogs take off in the middle of the night in the woods and this old, this old boy sitting on his four-wheeler and said, oh, that's Annie. Yep, she's got one treed. I'm like, how, what? How do you know that? There's a hundred dogs screaming, and you, you just know that your, your dog has a coon treed. How does he know his dog's voice? But he spent all this time. Some of you are thinking, uh, you, you, you uh, uh, relate with that one, and some of you relate with the kids one, but <laughs> I kind of like the coon one, to be honest with you. <laughs> but the truth of it is this, that when we don't spend time trying to listen, not just talking to God, but listening to God through a scripture and through prayer, we struggle with hearing. And here's the problem. When our spiritual hearing is struggling, that's when we get easily swayed. There are a lot of voices that call for your attention, aren't there? There are a lot of, of voices about all kinds of other things, and a lot of these other things aren't bad. They just aren't great. They're good, and they call for our attention, and they, and they cause us, in my opinion, to have this life that is overcommitted and underconnected. Right? That we can be so committed in this culture, but we're not really connecting at a deeper level. And I can confess, I struggle with that as well. And so what does it look like to listen and to spend time listening to the shepherd? All this, in my opinion, leads to trust and trusting the shepherd, which I think the sheep have. Uh, Tim Keller says this quote, which I found helpful. He said, um, if we are honest, we want a consultant and not a shepherd. Think about that. A shepherd means that you, you rely on him for everything. A consultant is, well, I'm good with all these things. I'm kind of struggling over here. Come in, I'll pay you your fee. Now you get back out. Help me fix this thing and then leave. And so when I, when I think about the surrendered life or the trusting life, aren't there areas of your life that you can trust God with and others that you kind of go, not this one. Like, I can think of areas in my life, I trust my children, I trust them to God. But there's other areas, like, uh, I'm going to hold on to that one. And something happens when we trust God with each area of our life. Our finances, our health, our future, our children, all these things. You actually experience freedom when you fully trust the shepherd with each aspect of your life. That that is, in my opinion, the definition of the full or abundant life is when you're completely trusting the shepherd for everything. Every provision, every next thing. Even those, uh, you know, as Steve was saying, there's people that we know are just waiting. They're waiting on news. And, but even in the midst of those situations, can we trust God and give those things over to God with each facet, each area of our life? I would say the more we focus on the shepherd's presence in each of those facets, the more we do experience the full life. My problem sometimes is instead of focusing on his presence in those areas, I focus on the problem in those areas. But when I focus on God's presence in the midst of it, like right now we're, we're thinking about getting close to maybe buying a house. It's much easier to freak out about that than to say, no, God is present in the whole process and to trust him in it. But I can feel myself saying, ah, I want to take that back. I want to take that back. And what does it look like to fully trust as we go tomorrow and talk about numbers and things that make my eyes cross? What does it look like to trust God even in that process that I think brings me some anxiety? I want to close with this. Many of you all, whether you've been raised in the church or not, have, have familiar with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. So if you say he's my shepherd, what, is that, what does that mean? 
And I wrote down a couple of things that I think, if, if I say he's my shepherd king, which I love that image, Jesus is the shepherd king. That's why the Pharisees couldn't wrap their head around this because this is a different kind of leader. But when I say that Jesus is my shepherd or the Lord is my shepherd, here's what I'm saying when I say that. He never leaves. But when I leave, like my story, the one in the 99, when I leave, he follows. He comes after. When I say my shepherd, I know that he goes ahead of me. I know that he continues to call me. I think God calls audibly. I think God calls us through all kinds of different things, through the community of faith, through prayer, through scripture. I think God is always calling. So when I say he's my shepherd, I think he continues to call. And I think when I, whether I realize it or not, my God is leading us as a community, I think, towards good food and good water, towards green pastures. And ultimately, if we pay attention, God is leading us to the abundant life. When we trust him with every aspect, we can start to see that he is leading us to the overflowing and abundant life. I want to close just by reading Psalm 23. As we say, uh, the Lord is our shepherd. I just want you to hear it, even though you've probably heard it your, maybe your whole life. And if you feel comfortable, I would love for you to close your eyes and listen, listen to these words about your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows abundant, full. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord God, <clears throat> when we say you are our shepherd, we want you to be our everything. God, it's hard for us uh, to surrender aspects of our life, but we do. We want to experience full freedom, and so we surrender each aspect of our life to you, the good shepherd the one who has told us that as we listen, as we hear our names called out, as we follow, as we are obedient to your call on our lives, we will continue to experience the fullness you offer us. And we are grateful for that, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray, and all God's people said, amen.